This lecture that considers general characteristics of the sensory systems and then physiology of vision consists of the two parts. Part 1 considers the optics of vision on the basis of a detailed structure of the visual system peripheral part, the eye. We begin with the definition of the sensory system. Sensory systems are the sets of the central nervous system structures that provide perception and analysis of stimuli of the external and internal environment, and also the adjustment of its peripheral part sensitivity by the efferent feedback mechanism. The sense organ is just a part of the sensory system, in particular its peripheral part. That includes, of course, mainly receptors, but also there are many other structures, additional protective or other structural elements of the peripheral part of the sensory system. Analyzer is the major part of the sensory system that includes the sensory ascending pathways. Each analyzer, according to classification of the Russian physiologist Pavlov, consists of the three parts, peripheral part, then conducting part, and finally the central part, which is always the sensory cortex of corresponding sensory system. An analyzer includes most of fibers that come ascending sensory fibers from periphery to the center, but also there ex exist less numerous fibers that come from the center down to periphery and this provides the adjustment, efferent central adjustment of the sensitivity of peripheral part receptors. And when we include these descending pathways for efferent adjustment, these together compose the sensory system. Classification of analyzers is simplest uh, on the basis of the types of our sensation. So we consider visual, auditory, vestibular, olfactory, taste analyzer, tactile, temperature, pain, and other analyzers corresponding to our sensations. Before switching to the con continuation, the classification of sensory receptors. Let's recall how many groups of different types of receptors exist. Actually, there are five groups of receptors. Mechanical receptors that respond by different ways to the mechanical stimulation. Then there is a group of thermoreceptors, nociceptors. Nociceptors are receptors of the pain sensation. Then electromagnetic photoreceptors and chemoreceptors. The largest group among all the receptors perhaps is the mechanical receptors group. You can see here the full list of different types of mechanical receptors. And there are many, many examples. Let's just recall something like free nerve endings, the simplest ones, then Meissner corpuscles, Krause corpuscles, then Pacinian corpuscles for tactile sensation, muscle spindles, which were considered in detail, Golgi tendon receptors, then we are going to consider in future receptors of cochlear and vestibular receptors, then baroreceptors located in carotid sinuses and aorta. So numerous mechanical receptors exist, exist of different type of complexity. Thermoreceptors are represented by just two types, cold and warm receptors. Nociceptors, pain receptors are free nerve endings. As for electromagnetic photoreceptors, which are to be considered very soon, are rods and cones receptors of retina. And rather big group of chemoreceptors exist. It includes taste receptors, olfactory receptors, receptors of aortic and carotid bodies that respond to oxygen, then osmoreceptors, receptors of aortic and carotid bodies that respond to carbon dioxide and H plus ions, and receptors for nutrients and so on. And with this, we finally, we should recall the sensory receptor cell types. There are two cases, pseudo-unipolar efferent neurons, which are themselves receptors, the nerve endings are receptors and specialized sensory cells that contact and stimulate the afferent neurons. 
more complex situation. Let's observe these two schematic presentations. Case A with free nerve ending and well, not necessarily free nerve ending, it can be some receptors, but anyway, this is a nerve ending of the pseudo unipolar efferent neuron, case A. And case B contains specialized sensory cell. When stimulus acts, it produces stimulation of the receptor membrane. And this receptor membrane can be uh, covering the ending of efferent neuron, or it can be specific receptor cell with vesicles that contain neurotransmitter. And then it contacts to efferent neuron fiber. In the first case, stimulation, for example, this one stimulation is too weak and it disappears, subthreshold stimulation. And if the stimulation reaches the threshold on the verge of this depolarization degree, it reaches the threshold and opens sodium channels and depolarization begins the first stage of action potential, first phase, and action potential is conducted along the fiber. Then case B, specialized sensory cell. When receptor potential is generated on its membrane, it results in a transmitter release into the synaptic cleft. And when transmitter is released, it binds to the postsynaptic membrane receptors on the nerve fiber ending and it opens channels that provide generation of action potential, which is finally conducted along the fiber to the central nervous system. The first case, A, when pseudonipolar efferent neurons are themselves receptors, this is the case for, for example, pacinian capacitors, muscle spindles, Golgi tendon organs, and, but many sensory systems use receptors of the type B when specialized sensory cell just stimulates the efferent neurons. For example, vestibular receptors, cochlear receptors, hair cells, and rodents cones, rodent cones of visual system. In the visual system it is even more complex as there is at least one cell between receptors, rodent cones, and the neuron that generates action potentials. So now we come to the visual analyzer. The general structure of visual analyzer and the visual sensory system is known from anatomy. Let's recall the main structures. The peripheral part is represented by the eye, where receptors are located in the retina, roads and cones. Then conducting pathways start, represented by optic nerves, then optic chiasm, and optic tracts that continue to the midbrain and uh, thalamic diencephalon structures, such as quadrigeminal plate and <coughs> geniculate lateral, lateral geniculate bodies. And finally, these pathways through optic radiations come to the third um, structure of the visual analyzer, which is the central part of visual cortex located in occipital brain portion. portion. The optic system of the eye provides focusing of an image of the object in the visual field on the retina. Here you can see the general principle of conduction of light from object. Actually, from each point of an object, light rays pass through the optic system into the retina, into the in internal portion, of the internal area of the eye, and it creates the image of object which is reversed because light passes through the lens. Object is re reversed and of course is diminished. Here you can see beneath the names of structures that are passed on the, by the light on the way to retina and beneath them you can see the numbers. These numbers are refractive indices. Indices of refraction show how much light rays change their direction or angle when passing from one media to the next one. And the greater is the difference, the greater will be change of light direction of conduction. Just perpendicular light is not uh, changed in its direction. Like, for example, now the line is straightly perpendicular to the cornea, and so exactly this line, this light ray, will not be uh, deflected and will go straightly as it goes initially. But all the other light rays that come to the under angle, they will be 
reflected, refracted and the direction of waves will be changed. And observe that first the light rays comes to the cornea, the first structure it encounters. And here the difference is the greatest. Observe cornea refractive index is much higher as for the ear. The greatest difference produces the greatest deviation of the direction of light rays. It's related to the difference of velocity of light conduction through different structures. Light comes mm, faster through the ear and less quick through the cornea. And then reflection occurs here the greatest. Then after passing the cornea, light comes to the aqueous humor, the fluid that fills the anterior chamber of the eye. And here a difference between cornea and aqueous humor. There is not great difference. And then light refraction is much less. When light passes through aqueous humor of the anterior chamber of the eye, then it comes to the lens. And lens also has different uh, refractive indices, different from the ear, but not, but not much different from the aqueous humor. So again, light is reflect refracted much less, and it passes. As again, I remind that this straight line is not uh, in the change of the direction, because it goes perpendicularly. After the lens, the next structure that light should pass on its way to retina is vitreous humor, the big structure with the fluid or in a gel-like state that fills most of the eyeball. And vitreous humor refraction coefficient is again refraction in this is not much different from the lens. Well, it's different, of course, from the ear. And then, again, refraction is not great in passing this light here. And finally, it strikes the retina and acts on receptors, the light. So you see, there are four structures progressively passed by the light on the way to retina. And the greatest refraction occurs, as you already know, in the transition from ear to the cornea. Total refractive power of the whole eye system is considered to be about 59 diopters. And the greatest part of this is made by cornea, about two thirds. Why we care so much about lens? We talk usually about lens. Because this is the only structure with variable refractive power. It can be changed. And Itself, it's about 20 out of these 59 diopters. When lens is in a um, state of uh, normal, regular, when we look to distant distance, then power is about 20. In this case, lens is uh, thin, more flat, and the variable reflective power can change the um, refractive power of the lens up to 14 units, 14 diopters. In its uh, flat state, it may become thick, and the force as well as strength of the lens increases up to 34, so plus 14 diopters. Of course, this is characteristic only for younger people, for teenagers and young people, and with age it ine um, inevitably decreases, more or less, and in um, aged people it can be two diopters or even up to zero. So, but for maximal ability it's um, about 14 diopters plus to initial state. And it's achieved by making the lens thicker. And it's not due to lens itself, because lens is a structure that uh, simply is uh, suspended within the capsule and passively it can be flattened and passively can be relaxed. Its natural shape is like shown here to the right side when its uh, strength is 34 diopters, natural shape, but it can be flattened due to um, position in the capsule. We are going to consider how it goes. But let's again recall the structures of the eye optic system. Cornea is an important structure, then anterior chamber filled with aqueous humor, then there is iris, which is a circular structure with opening aperture in the middle, which is a pupil. Then lens, which we already considered, and ciliary muscle that may change the shape of lens through the thin ligament, which is here present. 
and vitreous humor fills the uh, most of the eyeball behind the lens. Finally, there is retina on the posterior surface, inner surface of the eyeball. And in this retina we have the area with greatest visual acuity, which is the central fovea. Optic nerve goes out of the eyeball, and exactly in the area where it leaves the eyeball, there is a blind spot which doesn't have receptors. So this little area of the retina is not able to see, no receptors. But it's such a small structure that we even don't notice the presence of little blind spot in our visual field. The main structures that take part in accommodation. What is accommodation? This is a change in regulation of the refractive power. Refractive power of the lens and as a result of the total optic system of the eye is adjusted to the distance to the object because distance to the object is variable and distance from the lens to the retina is always constant. Let's observe now, this is the view from above. Here the cornea is shown, it's clearer than its non-transparent portion that covers the eye, and then iris, here you see only two portions because it's a cross-section, then lens, which is located behind the iris, and lens is suspended within its capsule by the zin ligament, or suspending ligament simply, zin ligament. And the active structure, which can change the stretch, uh, the thin ligament, and as a result, the shape of lens can be changed. This structure is the ciliary muscle. Ciliary muscle consists of the two types of fibers. The circular fibers, they really make a circle. Here on the cross section, you can see only two portions, but really it's a circle. And also there are meridional fibers that can pull the whole um, circle of ciliary muscle ahead which also decreases the diameter of the circle of the ciliary muscle. And then this is the view from front, frontal view, with uh, clearly visible ciliary muscle, which makes a circle around. And in the, between the ciliary muscle and the lens, what you can see, it's not the iris, it's exactly the suspensory ligament or zin ligament that connects the capsule of the lens with the ciliary muscle. And here it's the lens in the middle. It's not pupil. The um, iris is located uh, before these structures, so you cannot see the full lens, and lens is covered partially in the periphery by iris. Ciliary muscle is the Mm, smooth muscle that is narrated by ocular motor nerve. Here, even better, you can observe these structures close to reality, the ciliary muscle and zin ligament. This is the cornea, then sclera, non-transparent part, then iris can be visible here with mm, fibers of smooth muscle that pass inside. There are circular fibers and radial fibers, and depending on activation of these muscles, the opening or pupil size can be changed. Then you can see lens within its capsule, and also what is clearly visible, radial fibers of suspensory ligament or thin ligament that connects capsule of the lens with the ciliary muscle and ciliary muscle circular fibers are clearly visible here. And also there are ciliary muscle meridional fibers. Now you can observe how it happens, how occurs the adjustment of the lens thickness to the necessity. When we look at the distant objects, the um, connection uh, making the focusing of all the rays is easy and lens uh, strength as a lens should not be high and it's enough to have lens in flat state and flat lens can be when the ciliary muscle is relaxed and therefore the whole circle is high in diameter and uh, suspensory ligament is stretched strongly and it makes lens to be flattened and when we need to see objects located closer and closer progressively, the lens 
force and strength of, of the lens should be higher and higher, which can be achieved by thicker and thicker shape of the lens. And it can be achieved by relaxing of the ligaments, of the suspensor ligament, and uh, less stretching of the capsule, because lens naturally has a thick shape, almost spherical. And when it's not stretched in all directions, the capsule of the lens, lens inside becomes thicker progressively, because it's a natural shape of a lens. Let's observe the scanning micrograph. The, here you can see the ciliary muscle, here are fibers, thin ligament, zonal fiber or radial fibers, and here lens within this capsule. Accommodation. This is the process that we are going to consider in detail. This is the ability of optic system of the eye to adjust the refractive power according to the distance to the object. And, as already was mentioned, it's achieved by changing the lens thickness. And therefore, refractive power of the lens and the optic system of the eye as a total is changed. Here you see example of simply the lens. When light comes from the distant source, it goes almost in parallel lines. And the biconvex lens, as our lens in the eye is, take, change the direction of this um, light, so that making the focusing at a certain distance. And this is called the focal lens. In our case, for the eye, focal lens is always the same. It's a distance from the lens till the retina. But light can go differently, not in parallel. This is refractive power that depends on the focal distance. Look, as we see here, three types of lens with different thickness. They have different strengths as a lens, measured, merged in diopters, you see. When the focal distance is one meter, we say that this is just one diopter. If it's thicker and distant, focal distance becomes one, uh, half of a meter, so it's a two diopters. And ten diopters when distance is ten centimeters or 0 0.1 meter. And of course we understand that in the eyeballs the distance is less than ten centimeters clearly, so the force of ten diopters is not enough. We should have as we remember normally 59, but it can be variable depending on light mm, that comes from distant from source and distant source or from close source because of different angle of light rays. When the uh, with the increase of thickness of the lens, refractive power increases. We can observe here one, two to ten diopters, and of course with the even less focal distance, it can be higher force, higher strength of diopter, refractive power. The mechanism of accommodation. Let's observe and, and compare the state of the lens when we are looking at a distant object. First, ciliary muscle is relaxed. Suspensory ligament or zinal ligament is taut, very well stretched and lens within its capsule becomes thin and they fall fo focused for distant vision when light comes on almost in parallel lines. Then, opposite situation, when we are looking at a close object, we need to have greater power of the lens and it's achieved by increase of thickness. Ciliary muscle contracts. It provides relaxation of the suspensor ligaments, which makes lens to attain its natural thicker shape, and then it becomes focused for closed vision. Let's compare. In case of uh, relaxation of the ciliary muscle, the diameter of this circle becomes higher, and that makes suspensor ligaments to be stretched stronger and taut, and then it flattens the lens. When lens is stretched in all directions, it becomes flat, with little thickness. And when we are looking at a close object, and from close object, the light rays go under, under angle, and they come un, not parallel to the eye. Then we need stronger, higher refractive power. And you see, ciliary muscle contraction decreases the diameter, 
so suspensory ligaments can be not, not so much stretched and relaxed. And capsule is not stretched so much and lens inside becomes, as it naturally is, becomes much thicker and it makes a stronger lens with higher refractive power. So it's a good for close vision. And from distance to a close distance, close distance to the object, gradually ciliary muscle should be contracted more and more and more progressively until it reaches maximal contraction. And for normal eye, it is considered that it's possible until reaching the distance from the object to the eye, about 10 cm. And the eye reaches the maximal refractive power and further movement closer to the eye cannot produce normal focusing. So vision becomes blurred and no focus is achieved. It's a for normal eye, of course. Pupillary reflexes. The changing pupillary aperture, the opening of the pupilla. It's achieved by contraction or dilation of pupilla, you remember, due to <coughs> Uh, due to contraction of the, uh, cir cir <coughs> of the circular or radial fibers of muscles. Pupillary diameter depends on iris fibers, contraction on relaxation. A major function of the iris is regulation of the amount of light that enters the eye. When it's dark, it's necessary to increase the amount of light that comes to the eye. And for this purpose, we need to have dilation of pupilla or midriasis and to decrease the opening of pupilla in a bright light of the day and especially bright sunlight or something like this then it's necessary to decrease size of pupilla or myosis. I hope you remember that midriasis is achieved by sympathetic fiber stimulation and myosis by parasympathetic fibers of ocular motor nerve stimulation. And due to this, pupillary reflexes can change the quantity of light that enters the eye about 30 times, 30 fold. Pupillary reflex arc. Here you see both sympathetic and parasympathetic, but shown above, this is the parasympathetic case, which is response to the light exactly. So light reflex is a parasympathetic reflex of narrowing of pupilla. The upper part of the picture shows this process. Impulses pass from the optic nerves, because light comes to the retina, and optic nerves sends impulses not only to the visual cortex, but also to the pretectal nuclei, then to the edinger westphal nucleus, and finally through the oculomotor nerve number three, it goes to the autonomic ciliary ganglion, this is the parasympathetic nerve, and finally to the sphincter of the iris, circular muscle of the iris, and as a result pupilla size decreases due to contraction of the circular muscle and iris covers much more that covers the lens and amount of light that comes to the eye becomes less. This light reflex is important for estimation of the brain stem functioning and normally even in subconscious people it should operate if brain stem function is preserved. Beneath you can observe the sympathetic portion, which results in dilation of pupilla. It starts from upper thoracic segments of the spinal cord and through cervical sympathetic trunk. To, it comes to superior cervical sympathetic ganglion and then finally comes to the radial muscle of the iris, which provides dilation of pupilla in case of decreased light. Normal refraction of the eye and the main errors of refraction. It's very much important because many people nowadays have problems with refraction. So, the first case above, it shows the focus located exactly on the retina. It's called emmetropia, normal refraction. The eye, um, object system provides um, perfect focusing of the objects on the retina. But in many cases, there is no focusing 
exactly on retina. And most often the reason of this, not the optic system imperfections mostly, but the shape of the eyeball, which becomes too short or too long, as it's shown on these pictures. And beneath you see, the eyeball is too short and the reflective power of the eye is not enough to produce focusing on the retina. And focus theoretically can be formed somewhere behind the retina. But of course light comes to the retina and cannot move <laughs> further. And instead of normal focal point, there is a, a spot on the retina which is not perfect focusing, so vision becomes blurred. This is a case when focus is behind, theoretically, this is the case called hyperopia, or also it's called farsightedness. People have not um, bad vision when they look distantly, but for closer objects they are not able to focus them. An opposite case when the eyeball becomes too long and therefore focus appears to be formed before retina. And then light continuously goes to the retina and reaches the retina with not focusing. And again, the spot appears there. And this spot also has no focus and the visual is blurred, not clear. This is case of myopia or nearsightedness. These people can see well, um, very close to the eye objects, but their vision is limited with distance. They have no normal focusing and everything is not clear. So these are most widespread errors of refraction. And now we need to consider the correction of this refraction. Emetropia is normal case when focus is perfectly on the retina and there is no necessity in correction. Focusing is normal. Then this is case of myopia, nearsightedness. The focus is before retina, not necessarily so much before, but it depends on the degree of myopia. And for this case you may see that power of the optic system of the eye is too high. We need to decrease it. And Decrease is done with biconcave, not convex lenses. Myopia is corrected by biconcave lens, and this biconcave lens with this shape produces diversion of the light. You see, the parallel lines of light rays become diverted and they become going into all directions, divergent. And when light comes, it becomes diverging. So it's also called a negative lens because it doesn't uh, take the rays into one point but diverges them. And when we need add negative lens to the positive convex lens naturally present in the eye, it decreases the refractive power of the optic system. And if it's uh, chosen well, it becomes uh, adjusted to form exactly focus on the retina. Here you can see the hyperopia case, farsightedness when focus is behind the retina and the refractive power of the optic system is not enough. So we need to add some more lens to produce focusing on the retina. And for this purpose we use convex lenses and convex lens for hyperopia correction a positive lens. So we add some more refractive power to the eye that makes finally correction and reaching the focus on the retina. And there is one more case called astigmatism. When refractive power, astigmatism is case when refractive power is not equal in different planes of the object system of the eye. So not full focusing is achieved and part of objects is not clear in focus and part of object is more or less in focus but we cannot achieve, the patient cannot achieve the focusing of totally all, uh, everything in the visual field. And for this case, for the correction in this case, correspondingly uneven lens, uh, called cylindrical lens, are used for the correction and they should be adjusted in um, 
not only one um, strength, power, but also in a direction of unequal refraction. And where refraction is higher, the lens correspondingly should have less refraction power. And in the plane in which the optic system of the eye makes less um, refraction, the cylindrical lens should have greater for full um, compensation of unequal refraction in different planes. So cylindrical lens uh, cho choice is not very easy uh, as compared to the choice of uh, lenses for correction of far-sightedness or near-sightedness. Also, there are some types of eye abnormalities associated with age. And here, cataract, one of age-related age abnormalities. This is the appearance of the cloudy or opaque areas in the lens, non-transparent. Naturally, lens consists of fully transparent proteins. And with age, they may start to degenerate and coagulate. And then they become non-transparent. And initially, it may be just a little areas or points, but gradually they may become bigger and bigger, and finally they can obscure light passing through the whole lens and seriously impair vision up to just the ability to differentiate the light and darkness. And it can be corrected by surgical removal of the uh, lens, non-transparent, and replacing it with artificial lens. An artificial lens, contemporary, can be very close to normal functioning of the uh, natural lens. Presbyopia. Presbyopia is the other case, and actually it's very similar to hyperopia, but difference is different reasons. Presbyopia is abnormality associated with the decrease of the elasticity of lens ability to change shape. I told that initially, uh, that, um, initially, naturally, the lens is very much convex, it's close to spherical sh in shape. And as it's flattened in its capsule, it becomes thinner and with less refractive power. And with decreased stretching of the capsule, it should attain its natural shape, restore its natural shape due to its elasticity. But with age, more or less, inevitably, elasticity is decreased. In some people it's less expressed and, and comes later, but in most people's more or less, people, more or less it develops. And with contraction of the ciliary muscle, stretching of the, uh, through the ligaments, stretching of the capsule of lens becomes less and mm. lens should become more convex and it becomes not enough convex or in the severe cases it does not change its shape at all and remains thin and flat. So in this case the refractive power of the optic system of the eye becomes not enough and it looks similar to hyperopia. The same problem, the people cannot see close objects in focus. And correction goes in the same way as the correction of hyperopia. Just uh, presbyopia is associated with age, and hyperopia can occur even in little children. The power of accommodation decreases, and they use the same convex lenses, which add some more refractive power to the optic system of the eye. And in some cases, the people can use bifocal glasses. Actually, it can be used for both hyperopia and uh, presbyopia. Bifocal glasses, according to its name, that uh, implies that there should be two focus, so two focal distances. The glasses contain upper portion with uh, less uh, strength or less uh, reflective power, or even simply um, glass, and lower for near vision. Lower portions are positive convex lenses. So when a person looks uh, to the distance, it looks through the less um, powerful or even through simple glasses, and uh, it's easy to see the distant objects, for which uh, in both presbyopia and hyperopia people have normal vision. But for near objects, when for example for reading, uh, we look down to the book, for example, and then uh, in this case the vision comes through the uh, glasses portion with the positive lenses.
it's uh, sometimes more convenient than to put always glasses for reading and uh, remove them for looking um, for distance. So sometimes bifocal glasses are very convenient, so it's not necessary to change it always. Glaucoma is one more case. It's not abnormality of refraction now. This is the widespread problem that may be also associated with age. It's a disease of the eye in which the intraocular pressure becomes pathologically high. What happens in this case? It may suppress greatly, um, compress the fibers of the optic nerve. That is the main danger. When it develops? When <coughs> fluid that is constantly formed inside the eye and normally should outflow through the so-called canal of Schlem that passes in the angle between iris and cornea. In the next slides it will be shown. And if the fluid outflow is impeded somehow, then intraocular pressure can become high and high progressively. And when it compresses the axons of the optic nerve, finally it can produce death of these fibers. And it results in blindness. So glaucoma is one of the most common cases of blindness. Normal intraocular pressure is about 15 mm mercury with range from 12 to 20 mm mercury. For aged people, it's a standard procedure, regular measurement of the intraocular pressure in order to find uh, in the initial stage the development of glaucoma. Let's observe how the fluid is formed and flows out of the eye. Here you can see aqueous humor formed by ciliary processes in the angle between ciliary muscle and iris. This is the area of formation of aqueous humor. The ciliary, muscle, uh, ciliary cells have processes which greatly increase the total surface area for filtration of fluid and release into and chambers of the eye in this angle between ciliary muscle and iris. Fluid is constantly formed and then it flows to the canal of Schlem, which is venous vessel filled with this fluid. Practically it doesn't have any uh, blood cells because only the um, aqueous humor flows through this canal. You see, this is the way. From this angle it goes into anterior chamber and then goes to the angle between cornea and mm, iris. And there it is the canal of Schlem, where fluid goes. And with normal balance between formation and outflow of the fluid, pressure, intraocular pressure remains normal. If there is a sudden problem of outflow, the pressure starts to be increased. As for vitreous humor, here diffusion of fluid occurs slower because it's a gel-like structure, but this is also, uh, there is also balance between formation and outflow, and you see filtration and diffusion at retinal vessels occurs. Visual acuity. This is the ability to see surrounding objects placed at various distances clearly. It's a general definition, but in most cases we estimate visual acuity by ability to discriminate, to see separately two points located nearly. If we give the distance until the points, then we should also fix the distance between points, because with a closer distance, that con these points also can become closer to each other, and with greater distance, points should be more distant from each other. But one, one thing remains unchanged, this is angle under which these two points can be seen from the eye. And for measuring, measuring of such ability, the angle is measured. Mm. Angle is uh, as a basis of estimation of uh, definition of visual acuity. Normal human eye, basically, should be able to discriminate with uh, two points placed under the angle of vision of about one minute of arc. I one minute is just one sixtieth portion of the one angle of arc. But in some sources you may find even lower values, such as as low as 25 seconds, which is less than half of one minute of the arc. So we have 
high visual acuity. Of course, such a great visual acuity is characteristic not for the whole retina, but predominantly for the central fovea, where the distance, where you should understand, we, to discriminate two points, we should have at least one cone unexcited between the two excited cones by these points of uh, sor source of light or points uh, visible, uh, two black points on a white background. And if there is at least one unexcited cone between excited areas, so then we can differentiate as two points, they not join into one. And of course, the, the highest visual acuity only is available for the, mm, this fovea, central fovea. Visual acuity is determined using special tables with letters or figures or pictures of different size, so that we can change the size of object without changes of the distance from the eye till the object, because we are limited by rooms in ophthalmologists. Tables for visual acuity determination. Let's start from tables used in Russian. These are classical tables with the letters or broken rings, or for children it can be for different pictures. And these um, objects on the tables, letters or some other figures, are chosen for the size of the letters or different pictures. They have the details of each letter so that you can differentiate one letter from another. The exactly the details are about um, on the angle of about one minute of arc, as you can see here. Classically, these tables are viewed from five meters distance. And persons with normal visual acuity can see clearly exactly ten lines from above. You see. And normal visual acuity in this case is estimated as one. Look, this is number 10 line, and estimation of visual acuity is based on ratio of distance from which the person can see the object and uh, to the distance from which normal eye should see this object. So if two distances coincide, then visual acuity is ratio of two equal numbers is one. Look, here visual acuity is considered to be one because the distance is for determination, real distance is 5 meters when a person observes this uh, table. Also, table should be with a standard light to make sure that it's uh, equal standard conditions. And D, capital letter, is a due distance from which normal eye should see the line. And for the line tend is exactly 5 meters. So, when from the distance of 5 meters, person can read these letters, line, well, no mistakes, so the differentiation is easily done between very similar letters, then due distance is also 5 meters, then person has normal visual acuity, 1. And for any other size of object, and there is a calculation of V, visas, the ratio of uh, real distance to due distance. And real distance remains 5 meters, due distance can be variable depending on the size of object. For example, generally the whole table is arranged in such a way that each line gives 0 0.1. So, for, for example, first line should be visible, uh, look, if you look at the D uh, capital letter to the left, 50, 50 meters. These first two letters should be visible from 50 meters. And if this is the only line that can be read by the person sitting on 5 meters distance, so 5 divided by 50 will make 0 0.1. This is to the right side, V equals to 0 0.1. But if, for example, if one can read only four lines, then visual acuity is 0 0.4 because the distance is, uh, due distance is 12.5 uh, and 5 divided by 12.5 exactly gives 0 0.4. So it's easy uh, estimation, which even doesn't require to make any calculation, because the number of lines that can be read without mistakes, a line with mistakes, is not counted. So last line produced without mistakes shows exactly the um, visual acuity of a person. If person reads six lines, it's 0 0.6. If eight lines, it's 0 0.8, and so on. 
English tables for visual acuity evaluation similarly use letters of different size. Just the principle is, uh, principle is the same, but little difference exists. The tables are viewed from the distance of 20 feet, which makes 6 meters approximately. And results are expressed, again, as a ratio of real distance to the due distance. But in this case, it's 20 feet, and uh, they write it as 20 out of 20. That exactly corresponds to value 1 in Russian tables. You see here, this line num is the uh, eighth line here, but it corresponds to, if it's uh, viewed from 6 meters, 20 feet, and it should be viewed from this and read from this distance, then um, normal visual acuity is present. So normal visual acuity in English way expressed is 20 out of 20. And the um, equation for calculation is the same. D is 6 meters and capital D is due distance of reading. Here, for example, due distance is 200 feet or 60 meters. So if person can read only this first line, it makes 20 out of 200, or in the Russian way expressed, it will be 0 0.1. If two lines can be read, and uh, second line should be viewed and read correctly from 100 feet, so then 20 out of 100, which practically corresponds to 0 0.2, and so on. Then this is the end of this first part of the lecture, and lecture part 2 is expected to continue.